seas would have commingled into a single ocean, as uses the language of the Quran. God's will seems to have commanded otherwise. In the Masnavi, Jalaluddin Rumi addresses Moses and says, Thou hast come to unify and not to separate. Our function, despite the fact that there are two separate oceans, is precisely, or two separate seas, is precisely to unify and not to separate. Surely our task today and tomorrow is to follow this command that we cannot simply neglect the differences by pretending that they do not exist. What we hope to do is to use the common word between us to bring us closer together, not because differences do not exist, but in spite of the fact that they do exist. That's the role that the common word can play for us. Uh, as Friedrich Schoen, my old friend, once said, Accord between religions is not possible in the human atmosphere. It is only possible in the divine stratosphere. Of course, we do not live there. We live in the human atmosphere. But our hope is that while being aware of the human atmosphere, where different religious ideas and forms do exist, willed by God, we can ascend through the love of God and knowledge of God or sapience to that stratosphere we finally, where we can finally reach accord. But before we get there, the common word is to great dicta of Christ can guide us upon the path, despite all of our theological differences. Meanwhile, in this human atmosphere where we find ourselves, we see such apparently insurmountable differences as the emphasis of Islam on divine unity and the negation of Trinity, at least as understood in the Quran, because the Trinity described the Quran is not the same as that of the Nicene Creed. It really corresponds to certain local understandings of the Trinity. As you all know, in the early centuries of Christianity, there were hundreds and hundreds of different understandings of the Trinity. Uh, we just think there's only one doctrine now, but that in the first few centuries, I don't want to talk about it before all these eminent Christian scholars, but for our Muslim friends, they should know that. It's, as soon as you say Tathlif or Trinity, that doesn't mean what is being taught today by uh, Dr. Anderson, or by some theologian at St. Gregory University in Rome. Uh, uh, so I'm saying in the Quran, as I understood in the Quran. And the Christian emphasis on the Trinity, which is even transposed into the domain of unity itself. We disagree on the episodes at the end of the life of Christ, and of course his divinity, in contrast to his being a major prophet of God. We do not see eye to eye about the relation between canonical law and secular law on the one hand, and the Sharia and al qanun on the other. Nor do the Christians see how difficult it will be in the future for Muslim fuqaha, the scholars of Islamic law, to be, to be able to implement the ideas of the common word into fiqhi, that is juridical positions concerning Christians. This will be one of the great challenges to Muslim thinkers. That is to remove the anathema of kuf, of heresy from Christians, on the basis of their not being Muslims. This has been something that has been debated throughout Islamic history, but today is, of course, a very, very central issue for scholars of fiqh. I'm very glad that as an audience, we have eminent uh, members of this uh, who are faqis from both the Sunni and the Shiite world. Uh, while much of our ethics is similar, we do, not, uh, we do have differences concerning the sexual ethics and its relation to original sin, that is so central to much of Christianity and rejected by Islam. In this context of similarities and contrasts, we each follow the teachings of a religion that claims to have a universal message for the whole of humanity. And this claim itself has played no small role in the long history of animosity between the two religions. It has led to religious wars, crusades, Coercive missionary activity, coercive is not only military, but it is also financial and psychological. And much else has colored and still colors the relation between two religions. Christians accuse Muslims of violence without paying attention to their own history and to what the Native Americans in New England would have said of that relation of Christianity to violence had they survived to, att to attend this conference. Or to happen if it's the original uh, people of Connecticut were present right now to speak themselves. Muslims accuse Christians of not paying enough attention to the social teachings of religion based on justice, while not pointing out sufficiently to unjust practices that go on in parts of the Islamic world itself. 
A number of people on both sides also tend to paint the other in the color of an extreme fringe. Christianity using terrorism and Muslims blasphemy and the rise of Islamophobia, both of these being cringe, uh, fringe element of the two sides. Yet, yes, these and many other impediments that have to be confronted head on are not to be ignored. On the social and political level, the two religions have to be also self-critical of their own societies, self-critical of their own societies, and not simply surrender to the political forces of the two worlds in which they form a majority. On the theological level, there must be an in-depth dialogue if more external issues are to be solved. The theological differences cannot be simply thrown away, cast aside. I've refused, after 50 years of doing dialogue with Christianity, to ever participate if theological differences are considered to be unimportant. They are important. They must be understood, even if they cannot be solved in the sense of resolved into a single position. Without truth, religious dialogue becomes simply political expediency. And it's then better to leave it in the hands of diplomats rather than committed scholars of religion and theology. Deep theological dialogue does not necessarily mean the surrender of one side to the other. It does, does, however, mean that better understanding of the other and the greater mutual respect be brought about. At least one can agree to disagree, rather than casting anathema upon the other side. Of course, the ideal would be to, tra to transcend the formal order altogether, to reach the transcendent truth of which theological doctrines are so many crystallizations. That truth resides in the world of meaning beyond forms, in what, again, my dear fr uh, poet friend Rumi calls the spiritual retreat of God. But until we get there, we must be able to come together, to know each other, to love one another, and to face together the many challenges posed by a world based on the forgetfulness of God. And it's precisely in this situation that a common word between us and you can play such a crucial role and if there is sincerity and correct intention on both sides. A word must be said at the end about the meaning of the two commandments themselves. Uh, because some people have accused uh, Muslims of not loving God in the sense that Christians love them, as we were just so told, or even God not being the same thing in Christianity as in Islam, although I would suggest to those who think that Allah is a lunar deity in Arabic, that they go to Cairo or Amman on one Sunday morning and see what do, terms Christian priests use during their services for, for God. That's all they need to do. But anyway, coming now to the meaning of the two commandments, three related issues come to mind and need to be explained. The meaning of God, the meaning of love, and the meaning of love of God and the neighbor. Without some accord in these issues, we would be attacked by those who stand against this whole enterprise, or what we're doing here today, against mutual harmony and comprehension on the subject of the very terms we're using in, in the common word. There are already those of the Christian side, who well, said, reject the very word God used by us as Muslims as having the same meaning as Christians. However, let us remember that God is the God of Abraham. God is the God of Isaac and Ishmael and Moses and Muhammad, of course, Christ himself. And we all have the same God, although we may have different notions about God, even within a single religious community. In, speak, in speaking of the love of God, therefore, let us not accuse each other of referring to different gods. How can one study the Bible, including both the Old and the New Testament and the Quran, without accepting that we are all breathing throughout all the worlds created by these uh, sacred traditions within the same universe of Abrahamic monotheism? What could be more insidious or even demonic than trying to undercut the binding effect of Christ's two commandments by claiming that Christians and Muslims are referring to two different gods and not the single God whose mercy embraces all, as the Quran says. As for love, 
He found 2.2 million entries 